I want to welcome you all to the second of two lectures that are sponsored by the Levy Foundation and uh, you know, under the auspice of the Levy Chair and the Foundation of American Freedom. And uh, to briefly talk about that, the Levy Chair was created by a generous donation from the Thomas and Dorothy Levy Foundation in 1976. Among those who have held the chair have been Jean Kirkpatrick uh, for a lengthy period of time and recently Kathy Marcus. And most recently, on September, in September of 2004, uh, Georgetown President Jack DeJoya announced the appointment of Dr. Jean Bethke Elstein, who will assume the chair uh, in the fall of 2006. As part of the assumption of that chair, Dr. Elstein has graciously agreed to deliver a series of two lectures uh, at Georgetown that are based on our upcoming Gifford lectures uh, under the title of Sovereignties, which will be delivered at the University of Edinburgh. The Gifford Lectures, perhaps known to many of you, is a lecture series devoted to the study or discussion of natural theology. They are among the world's most prestigious lecture, uh, 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 in, uh, having counted among their number lectures by William James, Reinhold Niebuhr, and Iris Murdoch, among many others. One can think of few better contemporary thinkers to continue that extraordinary legacy than Dr. Jean Bethke Elstein. Dr. Elstein is the Laura Spellman Professor of Social and Political Ethics at the Divinity School of the University of Chicago. She is the author of over a dozen books and over 500 essays in scholarly journals and journals of civic opinion. Among those books, and just, uh, just for a few titles, are included Public Man and Private Woman, Democracy on Trial, Augustine and the Limits of Politics, Jane Addams and the Dream of American Democracy, and most recently, Just War Against Terror. Dr. Elstein's first lecture here, about a month ago, was entitled C.S. Lewis and the Abolition of Man. I can speak personally uh, from several of my classes that it was the subject of discussion and debate long after its delivery. I think not to be outdone, one anticipates that, at least by the title of tonight's lecture, uh, which is Religion and Enlightenment, the State of the Debate, uh, we can expect a lecture that will be at least as provocative. It is my great pleasure, and indeed my distinct honor, to introduce again to Georgetown University, Jean Van Elstein. Well, thank you very much. I'm uh, delighted to be here again, and thank you for coming out. I know it's a terrible time this semester for people, and you have many things to do, so I appreciate your presence. Um, I want to begin this lecture with uh, two iconic moments, uh, if you will. The first occurred when I was an undergraduate, which is more years ago now than I care to enumerate, uh, some time ago. When I was an undergraduate, it was in the 60s, I attended a lecture by Sir Julian Huxley, um, avatar of the Enlightenment and a distinguished branch off the tree, Huxley. Now, um, Sir Julian was formidable in his demeanor and his certitude. Uh, without any qualification or hesitation, he pronounced a prediction. In fact, he said this was a certainty for the future. And two of these, there were three of them, but I've only remembered two. I'm not quite sure what the third one was. But uh, two of the three predictions or certainties were the following. That by the year 2000, religion would have disappeared, having been supplanted by the total victory of what he called scientific rationality. And the second prediction was that nationalism would have disappeared, having been supplanted by the total victory of some sort of world order. Uh, these are obviously failed predictions. Um, but what's interesting in looking back at that particular moment is the fact that the view of the human person celebrated by Huxley uh, throughout his discussion was very much that of what I'm calling a sovereign individual, the notion of the uh, human being as the ruler of his domain, as the master of all he surveys, as someone uh, whose mission it is to bring control and reason to what would otherwise be the messy chaos of life. Now another iconic moment, this one very recent, and one that all of you uh, will recall. May 2005, um, when John Paul II, Pope John Paul II, lay in repose in Rome. And some of you surely remember the moment as his body was carried out into 
uh, St. Peter's um, into San Pietro Piazza. The pallbearers made a kind of circle through the crowd, and the crowd, of course, stretched as far as I could see, crowd of millions. And then they took him solemnly into the basilica as people wept and applauded. And here was another kind of reality, here another image of the human future embodied. Uh, in addition to the songs and the weeping and the applause of millions, uh, this great man's body was accompanied to its final resting place by the Litany of the Saints with its haunting chant that tells us that we are not alone, that when the believer makes his or her way to eternity, he or she is accompanied by the saints departed to join them in the other life. Now the view of the human person celebrated in this litany of the saints and honored by that overwhelming spectacle in Rome is very much that of the ensouled body, a uh, view of a person that, uh, a human being as intrinsically social, a being whose meaning and purpose is not reducible to what Václav Havel has called arrogant anthropocentrism. That is a view of the person that remains open to the possibility of the transcendent. Now, an interesting question to put is, which of these moments represents the contemporary West? The view of Huxley, or the sign of contradiction, as he himself liked to call it, embodied in the life and death of John Paul II. There could scarcely be a more striking contrast between frameworks of meaning, existential attitudes, understandings of the good, of how we arrive at the truth. There could scarcely be a wider gap than between a view that sees human life as encompassed entirely by birth, ending definitively with death, and with the time in between coming more and more under a certain kind of rationalistic and technological control, and even birth itself, for that matter, uh, coming under that kind of control. And by contrast, a view of human life as a gift and a blessing, one unearned by us, open to grace, given meaning because we understand that our good is not ours alone, but belongs to a wider communion of saints, a good that links us to a world of others who are, in some deep and abiding sense, our brothers and sisters. Now that we should wind up poised between such powerful and contrasting worlds as those embodied in Sir Julian Huxley's speech and in John Paul's life and death does not result from incoherence, as some moral philosophers might claim, but rather, I think, from our recognition of the unique telos embedded in each alternative understanding of human persons, and each of these has been deeded to us by our history. We see clearly that we have some alternatives here, a choice, but I worry that that choice is often presented to us in mendacious and inaccurate ways. For example, when we are told that we have to choose between science or faith, as if the two are irredeemably driven to collide. This claim, of course, usually comes from the side of science trying to discredit and discount faith. Although one also sees from the side of faith views of the self that surrender too much of our capacity to reason and to choose to forces outside ourselves, as if faith is a leap into the dark, a kind of fideistic certainty, rather than a more complex contextual engagement over time. Now, I want to try to avoid uh, the pitfall of presenting our situation as more stark than it, than it already is. And one way, I think, to do this with these two contrasting views in mind is to examine the fate of religion in the Western settlement or regime of toleration, and then to go on following that to look at the ways alternative pictures of reality tacitly, if not explicitly, rely on a particular philosophical or theological anthropology, a view of the human person. And then finally, and the finally part I don't think I'll finally get to, because otherwise the lecture would be too long, but if I were doing the whole thing, 
I have 40 pages here, so I'm not going to put you through that. Uh, I would go on at the end and ask whether any of this has something to offer us, reflections on these issues have something to offer us as we think about certain forces, international forces today, whether democratization, uh, globalization, uh, the nature of international, the international order, and so on. But I'll, I'll give some hints that direction when we get to the end. Now, in an essay of a few years ago, so we're starting with the first, the first part, which uh, you will recall is to look at religion uh, and the Western understanding of where it fits. Um, in an essay of a few years ago, arguing against what I called liberal monism, I'll explain what that is, I noted that one dominant strand of classical liberal legal and philosophical argumentation pushes toward a monistic logic. I'm going to explain what I mean by that. This monistic drive assumes, among other things, that we are to speak civically in a language carefully vetted in order to remove the taint of religious belief and the convictions that may cling to it. Now, I appreciate that the late John Rawls, from whom much of the most recent version of this argument is traced, modified his view somewhat. But the modification was rather grudging and the monistic drive remained, I think rather unsurprisingly, uh, given Rawls's neo-Kantianism. Now the argument assumes tacitly that a strictly secular idiom, carefully pruned, must be the language for political deliberation, that we have to clean up our speech. Rather than the free institutions of civil society and all their variety or religious faith giving us languages of civic engagement, these forces, or many of these forces, certainly religion, from the point of view of monism, are distorted by particularism and unacceptable because they, especially again, uh, civic language drawing upon religious belief, because it, let's put it this way, allegedly sees itself as somehow critically unassailable because derived from faith. Now, one might think of this monistic demand concerning civic speech as analogous to the constitutional position in American jurisprudence of strict separationism. Now, strict separationism I take to be a position that would strip all of public life of religious symbols and signs and markers and speech. Strict separationists are those who seek a thoroughly secularized society, not just a secular government, but a thoroughly secularized society in which religion is invisible to public life. Religion having long ago been relegated to the subjectivities of multiple individual consciences. Now for strong, strong separationists in the monistic tradition, uh, religion is by definition private. That is the idea of public religion or of a religion that enters and engages public life in all its aspects is seen as a threat to civic life, either because it aims inevitably to sacralize civic life, or even worse, that it pushes toward theocracy. And as you know, we hear dark murmurings about theocracy on many occasions in our own debates. Um, often, for example, um, where the Catholic Church's witness on the abortion question is concerned. You know, that's to do with people's private beliefs, and if we, in any way, respond to these claims, we are somehow on route. We've got a one-way ticket to, to theocracy. Now, you can help to make sense of those arguments, I think, if you know something of the nature of this logic and its historic uh, beginning points. So any notion of different forms of governance, reference, and civic meaning internal to a single society is so troubling then that it can only be read as a drive towards a religious establishment of some kind. Now, in an effort to forestall this possibility, it follows that all institutions internal to a democratic society must conform to a single authority principle a single standard of what counts as reason and deliberation, and a single vocabulary of political discussion. That's the logical endpoint, if you will. And it's the endpoint of the so-called secularization hypothesis 
that was being advanced by Sir Julian Huxley on that evening so many years ago now. Uh, this is a hypothesis that's discarded by most explicitly, but assumed by many implicitly. And because it's assumed, it doesn't even have to be defended or argued about. Now, what is the backdrop to this liberal monism that I've been talking about? Within political theory, I detect at least two strands, and I'm going to call these the Lockean and Rousseauian strands, respectively. Um, so those of you who are students of political theory, you can catch me up if you think I've got these people wrong. Um, John Locke was, in some respects at least, the unwitting prophet of liberal monism, given the terms under which he declared that religious tolerance must proceed. Now, many of you are no doubt familiar with his justly famous letter, Essay on Toleration, in which Locke uh, draws up a map that separates soulcraft from statecraft. Uh, soulcraft is the role of religion, statecraft is the realm of government. And you can be a citizen of each only so long as religion means kind of freedom of conscience rather than strong institutional loyalty to an autonomous religious body that engages society in all its aspects and is itself a particular form of governance. And Locke argued that his separation of statescraft and soulcraft created terms that would serve toleration for all religions, save two, atheism and Roman Catholicism, neither of which are to be tolerated. Atheists could not be tolerated because they refused to take an oath on the Bible and that made them untrustworthy. Catholics were, did not fit under these terms of tolerance because they exhibited a dangerous double loyalty. Again, they were loyal to church as well as to polity. So only so long as soulcraft didn't meddle with statescraft, it's fine. A strong public presence, voice, and civic action from the side of religion, that's problematic. That presents a danger. So private freedom of conscience fits this philosophy very well, fits liberal monism very well, but any strong expression of public religion, I'm not talking about established religion here. I hope you see that. Um, strong expression of public religion does not. Now this formula that I'm associating with Locke, I'm not sure entirely fairly, but um, finessed as many problems as it attempted to solve. Um, I think he's a kind of unwitting father in some ways, perhaps, in this tendency. For it is not at all clear that human beings conceal themselves off into compartments and be in the realm of soulcraft one moment, and then good subjects or citizens in the realm of statescraft the next. Instead, and necessarily, these categories bleed into one another. They do not remain in their proper spheres. Now, the second person from whom I'm tracing this monistic drive is Jean-Jacques Rousseau. Rousseau understood that you couldn't demarcate spheres so tidily. His solution was not, however, pluralism, but it was another cleaning up operation that required of religion that it be public, but only in a certain way. So the drive within his monistic account works like this. Societies require a civic religion that buttresses the legitimacy and authority of the state. An official civil religion welds together different parts of the polity and demands the citizens through a form of civic membership within which religion is subordinated to the good of the polity and serves that good, um, lost the syntax of that sentence, but at any rate, citizens are to make manifest their singular devotion to the polity and a civil religion helps them to do that as one vehicle for that. Any person divided in his loyalty and allegiance can never be a full-fledged participant in a well-ordered republic and might even pose a threat. You can, you can clearly see, uh, trace a line from these Rousseauian arguments and some of the architects of the, of the terror in the French Revolution, and you can also see a line uh, towards contemporary French laïcité, as it's called, laicism, uh, with the ban on the headscarf for Muslim schoolgirls and so forth. It's a direct sort of uh, descendant, if you will, of this kind of argumentation. Now, in his social contract, 
Rousseau commands, and I'm not saying he was an expert on Islam, please don't take me to be saying that, but it's fascinating when you read the social contract in light of all the forces that work in our world today, that he commands the wise system of Muhammad, as he calls it, because he said Muhammad fused the two heads of the ego into a single monistic structure. This, by contrast to Christianity, which separated them. So Christianity, Rousseau argues, is a terrible state of religion. Catholicism is the worst of all. Because Christianity divides a person's loyalty, puts people at odds with themselves. A uh, person becomes schizophrenic. So you have to heal this division. And it follows that his understanding of the system invented by Muhammad is to be preferred, the kind of theocratic system, is to be preferred to the schism Christianity introduced into the world when, as Rousseau asserts, Jesus came to establish on earth a spiritual kingdom by separating the theological system from the political system. He brought it about that the state ceased to be one and caused internal divisions which have never ceased to agitate Christian peoples. That's the end of the quote. So Rousseau would heal this division by instituting a stern civil religion in which the patria substitutes for God as the singular object of devotion and loyalty. And any God that enters in via a civic religion also lifts up the patria as the object of human longing. A citizen, he says, must gaze lovingly upon the fatherland from the moment he first draws breath. It must be ever in his heart, ever in his thoughts. Uh, if temporal and spiritual government are separated, then men see double, which is a phrase from Thomas Hobbes, who fretted about the same thing. So in their own ways, Locke, at least tacitly through privatization, and Rousseau explicitly through creating a civil religion, both of them push in this monistic direction. One must trump. Now, I want to bring in here, and um, there are a few pages that um, I, I'm drawing upon a paper I did on John Courtney Murray, which I presented here, what, a year and a half ago or something. So if anyone was there at that point, you might hear uh, some familiar uh, phrases or arguments, because John Courtney Murray offers up a very interesting contrast to this monistic um, drive, if you will. He took up this command to an undivided loyalty, this insistence. And Murray reminds us that there was an alternative. There is an alternative to this, or perhaps was. I'm not sure he thinks it can be recovered. Um, devised early on in the Latin Church, the so-called Galatian doctrine associated with Pope Galatius I and his two swords metaphor. And I'm sure many of you know this. There are two swords, roughly what we would call the secular and the spiritual now, but Regnum and Sacerdotium. And the spiritual possesses a superior dignity, but the secular, as we would now say, has its own purposes, as authorized by God. Uh, for medieval popes, especially the most ambitious, uh, the spiritual sword trumped in any case of conflict. Uh, we don't have to take up that historic issue here, but simply note that there's a big difference between the view there must be one and the view that there are two or more. And in fact, Murray's essay is about the one and the two. The latter, there are two, invites over time an understanding of pluralism and institutional diversity and integrity. The former moves to streamline matters and to eliminate tensions and conflicts by a kind of definitional fiat that takes a legalistic form in the, the thought and work of our own strict separationists. Now Murray reminds us in this essay that Vital to the Galatian doctrine was the freedom of the church, of the church to be church. And he says the following, this freedom of the church as a spiritual authority served as the limiting principle of the power of government. Um, sorry, I read that wrong. Let me do it again. I didn't put the emphasis right. 
This freedom of the church as the spiritual authority served as the limiting principle of the power of government. To put it briefly, the church stood between the body politic, the people, and the public power. We would now say, we would say the state, I suppose. Not only, I'm still quoting, limiting the reach of the power over the people, but also mobilizing the moral consensus of the people and bringing it to bear upon power, thus to ensure that the king, and the fine phrase of John of Salisbury, would fight for justice and the freedom of the people. That's the uh, end of the quote. So in a sense, Murray tells us, the creation of what he calls free political institutions follows from a model of the institutional freedom of the church. And this was vital for the bulwark provided by the institutional church could no longer be assumed when Christendom fragmented um, and you had the sort of recognition of this fragmentation, first with Oxbury in 1555 and Westphalia in 1648, the enshrinement of the principle of state sovereignty and with it uh, the principle that the religion of the ruler is the religion of the people. So once again we see this drive to a kind of internal homogeneity. We cannot encompass sort of plural forms, in this case of religious faith. So this led, over time, to a triumph for a kind of internal monism as a model, taking the form, remember, of either an excess of privatization of religion or an official state religion that defanged Christianity in its dealings with political power because it was an ancillary of the state apparatus. I'm jumping over many centuries here. I, I, hope, I hope you can bear with me. Um, there's a longer argument that one could mount here, I'm not going to do it, about the relative weakness of multiple individual consciences by contrast to the hard work once done by Libertas Ecclesia, by the liberty, institutional liberty of the church. But I can't go down this particular path. I just want to conclude this section uh, by putting the question, is there a drive in modernity to expunge the two? And you can see that, if you, if you think back to Sir Julian Huxley, you can certainly see it there. We will just eliminate religion, or get it out of the way. Now, if Murray is correct that the very dignity of the human person demands a different sort of governance, than that presented by in monistic structures, this is obviously a very serious matter. And I'll turn to it next with a discussion of anthropologies or views of the human person and politics. Now, Murray touches on this question when he suggests that any notion of the absoluteness of will, when the will became a dominant force in thinking about political life, whether the will of the sovereign monarch or the will of the sovereign people, as in Rousseau with the general will, that this begins to create terrible mutations of the sort that devastated the 20th century. And this takes us back to a vital matter, which is a question about what kinds of cells human beings are anyway. What sort of self is assumed by the monistic position or required if it is to succeed the sovereign mastery of the individual articulated by Sir Julian Huxley. By contrast, what sort of self is suggested, at least implicitly, if not explicitly, by the notion of a world of plural sites, of power, authority, loyalty, and identity within the framework of a single polity. What sorts of cells committed themselves, to go back to one of the iconic moments at the beginning, to hours and hours on their feet, little feet, little sleep, little food, uh, not enough water to drink, just for the most fleeting glimpse of the body of John Paul II lying in repose in St. Peter's. And as I thought about that moment and watched it unfold, I realized that so many of the models of the human being that we are now working with, that are dominant in our thinking, including in the social sciences, are so inadequate, are not up to the task of understanding those kinds of moments, uh, including the 
econometric model, which is very pervasive, human beings as calculators of their own marginal utilities, I don't think can begin to account for what we saw in May in Rome. Now, there are multiple ways to be a sovereign self. Monism assumes that the self must be internally monistic, not have these conflicts going on, because it divides the self. You see double. In order that, and we have to eliminate that, in order that this self can participate properly and fully in the project of monism externally, because the self can't have a complexity or plurality. The self should never be put in a position to assess the worthy from the unworthy that you begin to get when you get competing visions of the good and the meaning and purpose of human life. Um, part of the reason for this insistence is the view that the self is, in a very real sense, brought into being by society. Um, now, in Locke's world, we were at least social in some ways. The polity doesn't precisely give birth to us. We were social before we became political. We did possess some rudimentary social forms, including the family. But finally, it is the writ of the constitution of the political that creates clarity when it spreads that writ over most, if not all, areas of human life, although in his vision, that hand rests rather gently some of the time. Religion, as I've already noted, and this view can be left alone so long as it doesn't directly confront public power, so long as it is a religion of private piety and conscience. Now, Rousseau's monism is, is far more troubling to the extent that Locke can be said to be, or this is sort of Lockean strain that is put it that way. In Rousseau's world, those of you who've read Rousseau know, his vision of human beings is that we were rather stupid, wandering isolates who would slake our thirst at streams, eat berries, come together during mating season, not form social units. Then you have the story of our evolution, uh, which is really for him a kind of devolution from our sturdy, basic primal cells. We are isolates and we remain such until we are somehow forged together finally, the story is complicated as you know, into a general will by our initiation into a polity. And he speaks of this in his initiation in quasi-religious <coughs> terms. It's the utter transformation of the self. It's the replacement of instinct, uh, sort of the dumb, blunt instinct by justice. Um, we are utterly in debt to the social power. We cannot descend from the general will at any moment or in any particular, or we in effect descend from the whole and become traitors to that which gave us our identities. We are outlaws at that moment. Now various permutations of these and other strands, including those represented by Huxley's celebration of enlightened rationality by contrast to old superstitions, including faith, have culminated in our own time and the articulation of sort of strong self-mastery. Not moral autonomy, talking about strong self-mastery. Sartre and existentialism would be another example of this. Um, I read the other day that Anne Rand's Alice Shrug still sells something like 100,000 copies a year. That's obviously, in that philosophy, you have another version. Some versions of American jurisprudence present this vision of a sovereign self. Some variants on American radical feminism um, underscore a relentless vision of self-sovereignty. That we are ourselves only when we are in full and complete control. And we refuse to recognize intrinsic limits to our own projects. And this notion of freedom extends not only to the world of money, property, possession, and commerce, but now increasingly to all areas of human existence, including the body itself, which I talked about in my previous lecture. Indeed, we have arrived at the point where, as you know, everything is in, in principle is commodifiable uh, on the arguments of many. Nothing is to be valued for its own sake. So we have entirely respectable and respected 
academics and jurists as just one example, uh, arguing that uh, we should have a market in babies, we should have babies selling, because it would be a far more rational way, efficient way to allocate a scarce resource than something as clumsy and old-fashioned as adoption. The, the notion that what the self is about is expanding choices, enhancing control, uh, and we define freedom in this way. Anything that, that smacks of the unchosen is a diminution of our freedom, a diminution of the self, uh, and has to be resisted. Any notion that we may incur obligations that are unchosen is unacceptable. Um, has to be excoriated as belonging to some backward set of ideas that we have moved out of. Now, the philosopher Charles Taylor calls this cluster of developments that I've been talking about a version of excarnation, excarnation. The notion that the self is steadily disembodied, disassembled into its component parts. Um, that all are driven by will, and a kind of self-sovereignty that can assemble or alienate these parts at will, thinking of some of the modern genetic and biological technologies. So what contrast does the world of two of many of pilgrimages say about the self by contrast? Well, I think that we could say within that vision, there is still some incarnational notion of being that's kept alive, um, a view, as I mentioned earlier, of the uh, ensouled body, um, the human being who, uh, over a lifespan, strives to display the fullness and dignity and wonder of uh, embodied creation, if you will, beginning with that of the self, a uh, notion of the self that tries to fight against the deadness that is around us, that is, the notion that the world is matter to manipulate. Within the vision of the pilgrimage self, we are not so much individuals whose sociality is the result of our own voluntaristic motion, but we are persons whose sociality is, is given. And as human beings moved into modernity, this complex concept of the person one that worked to keep together, not excarnational, incarnational, dignity, intimacy, relationality, interiority, um, that, that, that thought itself cannot be disembodied, if you will, and so forth. All of that began to fade, even as any notion of um, sort of embodied images of political incorporation faded, Everything now is generated by a kind of contractarianism. And in this contractarianism, I see some excisions of our, our sociality. Now, I think that one reason you had that outpouring at, on the death of uh, Pope John Paul II is because he was able to capture, not assuming that most of the people who flooded to Rome had read his very dense and complicated encyclicals and so on. But in his being, in the way he presented himself, and the way he engaged with others, and the way he established a kind of personal connection, even within the, with these throngs that turned out to see him, that he was able to capture something of this bleeding away of incarnational being, and, and he was aiming to restore that by lifting up the dignity of the human person, not as a slogan, but as a very potent idea. And it was this idea, as you know, that he defended throughout his life whenever and wherever he believed human dignity was threatened, arguing in Veritas Splendor, for example, that our being, our understanding of the self, is not reducible to psychological or biological or sociological or economic predicates that cannot capture the complexity of the self. Now, in the longer paper here, I go over some of these arguments from some of the encyclicals. I'm going to just give you a, a teeny little flavor of this and not do the whole thing. 
from <clears throat> one of my own favorites, the 1981 encyclical on labor, law room exergence, where he links a proper understanding of work to human dignity. And in this encyclical, he, he criticizes all materialistic and economistic thought that reverses the right order of things by ignoring the meaning of work for the human person, for the one working. He insists that all human beings, including those with disabilities, should have a place at the great workbench of life. That all systems of forced labor, all systems that turn work, quote, into a means for oppressing human beings and exploiting human labor must be repudiated because they do damage to the dignity and subjectivity proper to man, the human being. Further, this dignity of the human person, male and female, is inseparable from a view of human freedom that's worthy of endorsement, a, view, a vision of freedom that's dramatically at odds with many culturally prominent pronouncements that proclaim us sovereigns of ourselves, wholly self-possessing. And Evangelium Vitae, he writes that if the promotion of the self is understood in terms of absolute autonomy, which I'm calling sovereignty, people inevitably reach the point of rejecting one another. Everyone else is considered an enemy from whom one has to defend oneself. And as I read this, I thought immediately of some of uh, the sentences you get from, from Sartre. Not just the hell is other people, but the arguments, you know, the arguments that every encounter, you know, was an engagement in which you were trying to impose your will on the other. One of the most hilarious, uh, unintentionally hilarious, comments he made along those lines is when he was describing skiing as if he ever tried it, but skiing as the as somehow the appropriation of this expanse of snow or something under the cell is utterly bizarre. But anyway, everything is that. Uh, the implications for society are dire, John Paul continues, for society becomes a mass of individuals placed side by side without any mutual bond. Solidarity is lost. So in his argument against abstract notions of absolute freedom and self-possession, John Paul criticizes all those who worship at the altar of the self and insists that true human freedom is attained only in and through incarnated realities, real communities, relationships with others. Um, one of the tragedies in late modernity, uh, he insists, is that when we flatten the moral horizon, actually I guess I'm the one insisting that based on what he said, when we flatten the moral horizon and make our own projects absolute, then we treat others obviously as means to our own hands. Now, um, a couple of more words, and then I, I'm going to bring this to, um, move to the very last few uh, pages here. Um, this is from Evangelium Vitae, uh, where he continues to develop this theme about the worth of the human person, and uh, argues that human dignity is threatened in many ways by murder, genocide, euthanasia, abortion, willful self-destruction, mutilation, torments inflicted on body or mind, all insults to human dignity. And then he goes on to note that there are expanding threats to our dignity in certain prospects that have been opened up by scientific and technological progress, which of course is the very process celebrated and sanctified by that Mr. Huxley in advancing that secular, secularization hypothesis. And you can see this drive towards a kind of perfectionism in many of the arguments of those who are most enthusiastic about what genetic manipulation and engineering is going to achieve for us. So John Paul notes a terrible paradox at the heart of late modernity. And I noted this in my own way in my previous lecture, that on the one hand, we solemnly affirm human rights, but on the other, we deny many of those rights in practice, given a notion of freedom which exalts the isolated individual in an absolute way and gives no place to solidarity, openness to others, and service to them. And this leads, he concludes, to serious distortions of life in society. So, 
Where does this lead us? Leaves me first to hang on a civil war. What we see, I think, at present is not then modernity versus anti-modernity or religion versus enlightenment or faith versus reason, but one vision and version of modernity by contrast to other, another quite different one, another quite different version. And I think the thinking about these issues enables us to ask certain questions, um, to ask ourselves which version of modernity is being played out in contemporary political projects that claim and aim for an inter international common good. What's the understanding of the person involved in those? Um, what's the understanding of the human person involved in the projects I already talked about? Achieving a certain kind of perfection of uh, the human body, the human genome itself, and so on. So I think this angle of vision gives us some critical leverage in thinking about many of the issues uh, that confront us today. Now, in the last section, which I'm largely going to skip over, but I want to give you a sense of what I go on to do, I look at some of these contemporary developments, as I mentioned at the outset, globalization, democratization, and so on, and try to ask myself what understanding of the, of the self and of the nature of the world we're part of and the world we hope to come, um, what's at work, and these contrasting movements and efforts. And one of them that I take up is, in fact, democracy movements. Um, democracy movements now active in our international life, and thinking about what form these will take, what culturally specific monistic or plural forms this might take. And one of the reasons that uh, those who are, uh, call themselves uh, civil society, uh, Muslims or moderate uh, followers of, of Islam, one of the reasons they're so worried about the, the radical ideology of Islamism is precisely because it pushes for the cruel monism that was on display in the rule, if you want to call it that, the misrule of the Taliban in Afghanistan. But I learned something fascinating. This isn't in my talk, but I want to tell you about it. Um, about two weeks ago, I was in Casablanca, and there was a small group of us, uh, American uh, scholars and intellectuals meeting with a small group of um, Arab Muslim scholars and intellectuals. And what became very clear after about two days that were alternately revealing and frustrating was that the only alternative that they were seeing to a kind of Islamist theocracy, this Islamist monism, was a version of modern secularism that they also found unacceptable. And that version of modern secularism was very much the sort of French laicist model. That to them was the West. That's what the West did with these issues. It moved in that radical laicist direction. So those of us present from the United States spent a lot of time trying to make the point that the French model, radical laicite, um, is not the only available one for how we think about the issue of religion in relation to political life. Uh, that for all the messiness of the American experiment, I mean, temporary America itself on these issues, that it offers another way. You don't have to relinquish your faith in order to be a good citizen. It doesn't have to become in, in, invisible to public life. So some of the thinkers that, that they kept mentioning as of signal importance, like Voltaire, are for many of us minor annoyances. Um, so it's, it, it's really a very, it's a fascinating uh, business. But there's a lot more, obviously, that needs to be done, including, and our uh, Muslim colleagues understood this, looking at the repertoire available for them, to them, for working out these issues uh, in their own way. I'm not assuming that the way that gets worked out will be identical to um, the multiple ways that we have sorted this out in the West. <clears throat> One other moment when some of these issues uh, in, in a rather different form came up. After what I was in Casablanca and then Zurich for something, I'm skipping Zurich, and then Amsterdam, 
um, from meeting on uh, under the rubric, um, what are the serious defects of contemporary European society? Um, there were about 900 people who showed up, and at first I felt a bit odd as an American being there to and asked to, to explicitly address this, but hearing so many criticisms of the United States, I didn't feel so badly at all, but I finally got, got a chance to say something. And one of the arguments that I made was that in Europe, uh, culturally, is the creation of the sort of coming together and contestation between Jerusalem and Athens and Rome, um, the Enlightenment, Catholicism, the Reformation, and that if you lose Jerusalem, if you abandon Jerusalem, and the faiths, the versions of, of Christianity that came from Jerusalem, and uh, Judaism obviously is another big issue in contemporary Europe, as you know, but if you abandon that, you don't have Europe anymore. What you've got is a certain kind of distorted version of the Enlightenment tradition that begins to, uh, absent serious and sustained challenge, begins to go in very troubling uh, directions. And one of the troubling ways was one I mentioned in my first lecture here a, few, a month ago, was the, the new protocols in the Netherlands for euthanizing handicapped newborns. Um, very sloppy notion of you know making a determination of seriously handicapped newborns. And you can see if there are not serious challenges to these sorts of things, the direction some of this might take. I have to say that, uh, save for the, the future king of Belgium, um, who sat next to me at dinner and wanted to talk about these things, I didn't, um, and a very funny moment there too, because he, he came up to me in the food line and said, um, and he said that he was a Pierre of Belgium. And I said, I'm Gene of Chicago and Nashville. And, and he said, no, 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 I am, I am Pierre. I, I am the Prince Charles of Belgium. And then I said, gee, I hadn't been in a line, you know, food line before with the future king. So that was, that was kind of interesting. Later, I was talking to a fellow from the UK who's the editor of the Times Literary Supplement. And he said, oh, I saw you were talking to the future king of Belgium, and I said, yeah, he's very interested in these religious things. He said, he said, well, I had a funny moment with him. He said, he came up to me and said, I am Pierre of, of Belgium, and I said, oh, jolly good, I'm Freddie from London. <laughs> and so everyone was having this experience with Pierre from, from Belgium. Uh, but a very, very nice man, I have to say, a very nice man. That these issues just fell flat. People didn't want to talk about them. It was very clear to me that that, that debate is a debate that is, I think it's going on sort of quietly, but it's not being versed, voiced publicly. And the fellow who organized this meeting in the Netherlands um, said that the uh, group, that is the, the, the patrons of his effort, of his institute and the journal that's published, that if they ran an issue devoted to the question of what's happening with um, with religion in contemporary Europe, and you had people speaking positively about the Christian heritage, that in fact their funding would immediately be pulled. Uh, that there's that kind of, uh, of animus, in, um, certainly in elite circles, and I think more generally. So these are huge issues, um, and they're refracted differently, clearly in contemporary Europe and in the United States. And I think they're refracted differently in part because uh, of our commitment from the beginning <clears throat> to religious freedom. <clears throat> um, and the fact that our founders were not so afraid, S some folks are today, but not so afraid of, of what free exercise would, would lead to. Um, well, uh, having told those stories, um, it's probably, uh, probably this is the best point for me to end. So thank you very much. I'm sorry that kind of trailed off and got messy at the end, but it, there was just way too much to uh, to uh, present. Yes, way in the back. I was wondering if you could give us an example of uh, one of the human rights that we suddenly defend and it's 
Ah, well, um, I want you to think of a couple of different examples, I think, of, um, I think the best way to approach it would be, and then I'll get to some concrete examples, the best way to approach it would be this way, would be to think first of those to, hum to whom uh, human rights applies. Um, what category of beings do we attach rights to? And as soon as you say uh, rights attached to uh, human beings, uh, that seems a kind of self-evident response. Uh, but then we realize that it's not as self-evident as uh, it seems because there are efforts being made, clearly, based on certain kinds of logics, uh, to say human rights apply to uh, all save you know, certain kinds of persons who perhaps um, are not fully rational and cannot understand certain things. I'm thinking here of the, the arguments of, um, I mentioned him last time, with Peter Singer in Princeton, you know, who, uh, who was quite prepared to eliminate any rights claims that uh, certain persons have, um, especially uh, young persons, newborns, and even a bit older, uh, because they haven't reached a certain stage of self-consciousness yet. Um, so, and, and because some will never reach that stage of self-consciousness, uh, they can, they are simply, um, can be dealt with uh, by the will of others. They don't have that kind of standing that one associates with human rights, including most fundamentally, obviously, a basic right to, to life itself. Uh, that immediately in the United States gets us into a debate about abortion, clearly, and here, um, as you know, our law is, uh, laws are really kind of a, an incoherent mix at the moment because you have all kinds of laws in many states uh, that uh, see the fetus as a person, as you know, for the purpose of, for example, um, if, a, if a pregnant woman is assaulted and the fetus dies, the person who assaulted her, let's say if she's killed as well, can be tried for, for, two, for double homicide. Um, so clearly, the, you have a certain status attached. There are certain rights that we assume that this being had that had been violently taken away. But for other purposes, um, including late stage abortions, you know, fetuses have no such rights. So we have our own versions of dealing with these, these issues, as you know. And I think that the anthropological questions I was putting on the table about how do we understand the self are, are absolutely fundamental and thinking about the question of rights so that we don't get into a situation where we begin to narrow our understanding of to whom rights apply. Um, and you know, we proliferate rights, but we narrow the boundary of, of, of to whom they apply. Uh, many of the elderly obviously are worried about this given euthanasia uh, proposals. Um, people from the disabilities community, as they like to call themselves, uh, also are concerned that the full understanding of rights under which they understand themselves, uh, in fact, is in danger of being uh, in danger of being withdrawn because of another proclaimed right that some are seeking, including right to die. Does that give you some example of? Okay, that that's how I would start to think about some of these some of these issues. Yeah. Uh, where could we draw information for the construction of the cell from from a bad from the bad point? And From the what? Sorry, say again. You mentioned Pope John Paul. Yes, yes. Is there proper point of view from the Vatican about what constitutes or constructs a self, or is it something that you've drawn from various instances? Ah, well, you know, you um, obviously I've been drawing from lots of different sources, but um, because in the life and work of, of John Paul, this was the heart of it. You know, it was that the under a certain understanding of the human person. Uh, you, it's simply inescapable if you read any of the, the documents that he was responsible for over the course of his 26, 27 year uh, pontificate. Um, what's interesting is the way he uh, brings together many of the main currents of 20th century philosophy, uh, personalism, phenomenology, um, human rights arguments, and, and sort of weaves them, interweaves them with the basic Thomistic structure that has been the, as you know, the sort of fundamental uh, structure of, of, uh, of papal thought, the magisterium, uh, since, since Aquinas. 
Um, and the way in which John Paul brings these in um, is done in such a way as to enhance a, a, the sense of the sort of um, enormous worth of the human of a human person, enormous worth and dignity. Obviously, he's also drawing from the terrible history of the 20th century. Now, in other words, much of the lessons he's learned about human dignity, he learned negatively when he saw how systematically that can be assaulted um, and how horribly. Um, or that, that there is danger uh, in a kind of extreme world seem to yeah. exclude yeah. all yeah. religious language logic from the public discussion. And yet, it does seem to me that in a genuinely pluralistic and democratic society, yeah. there is an obligation on the part of leaders to give reasons to the public, a broad public, that are not rooted in religious arguments, and that there is at some point in here, kind of uh, sealing it in an inadequate way from Father Brian here. Yeah. But I think there's something uh, inadequate and morally troubling by leaders who might use religious logic in a public argument in a pluralistic society. Yeah. Okay. Well, um, I mean, clearly I, I understand uh, your point and, and, um, and share it. Um, in the, in the, the kind of rigid attempt to excise not just religious language, but but uh, certain uh, language of certain understandings derived from religion, uh, in the kind of set of strict rules and then, um, you know, logic, and that clearly goes goes uh, way overboard in making an argument about the kind of abstract language of deliberative democracy that we all have to speak. And I, for one, have never quite figured out what on earth what, what we'd be talking about finally. Uh, in and through such an abstract language. So people come to the public square from lots of different sites, as you know. The question is, then, once we're engaging one another, uh, do we just continue to advance our own particular understandings, or is there a way in which we're obliged, when we're trying to uh, engage in the building of commonalities that poly democratic politics requires, are we obliged to begin to think of civic ways that we can we can make common cause. And because the President of the United States is primus inter paris among civic speakers, if you will, uh, he, she at some point, uh, above all, has an obligation, I think, to use the languages of, of, of America, um, which, are, which are multiple. You know, there are numbers of different idioms, and times change. I mean, in Lincoln's second inaugural, which as you know, is just two very short pages in the collected the American Library of Collected Lincoln. Uh, he evokes the deity 14 times. He's got a very complex uh, and sober view of, of, of kind of um, uh, God's foreknowledge and God's divine justice uh, bringing the suffering down on us. It's, the, the rhetoric is unparalleled. I don't think an American president could talk that way now. Uh, that it would be seen as too far too biblical um, and far too, uh, you know, far too, um, in its own way, monistic, if you will, assuming a kind of homogeneity of religious identity that we can't any longer assume. And yet, you don't want to lose some of the power, um, the evocative power, you know, of, of of what Lincoln had available to him. So I think it's entirely reasonable for presidents to draw upon that and. Um, and to bring it to bear in their public utterances. I mean, one moment I, I uh, can think of was I was at, was watching on television. It was the 10th anniversary of the Oklahoma City bombing, and uh, former President Clinton was there. And and as you know better than anyone else in this room, um, he has an ease with putting biblical passages, um, and he and he did it. You know. It, it, um, repeatedly, and it seemed to me entirely appropriate to that civic and public occasion. So I don't think that you can, I don't think that you can draw a bright line. Uh, but I do think that we, most of us who share the positions you and I share, would I, I think we, we, we could recognize instances when we think we think it's gone too far. It's become too exclusionary. It's become too confessional, um, and it isn't speaking civically. Anymore, but I, I'd be very loath to set up a tick list, you know, because of what we might lose if we if we did that. Peter, question, Peter, um, you, you have to 
convinced me, I think, that uh, mm -hmm. liberal monism and yeah. dignity uh, it can do justice to the dignity of the individual. But, um, but what about this liberal monism? Do you, do you think that it represents a kind of contemporary... ...of a strength in liberalism? I don't think it begins to exhaust uh, various liberalisms, because liberalism is itself plural and not singular. Um, but it's a strain, as you know, that those of us certainly in the academy, people in law, that you confront frequently, um, and more frequently than many others do. So one perhaps exaggerates the importance of it in some ways. But it's, um, but I think it's very useful to look at what holds that together and to think of how it, it came to be. And then one could go on, if you were doing a fuller treatment of liberalisms, uh, to look at other approaches that can reasonably be called liberal that in fact offer challenges to this liberal monism. As you know, I wasn't doing that here. I was looking at challenges coming from another direction. But you could certainly do that within the within the liberal tradition. Very broadly construed, it seems to me. Uh, for those of you who wanted to ask a question, I want to invite you and everyone else as well uh, to a reception here in the uh, uh, atrium, or gallery, I'm sorry, of the uh, ICC building. It's right here on the uh, third floor. So, and please join me as well in thanking you. Guys.